<laughs> Sorry, guys. I'll take responsibility for that one. <laughs> <laughs> for once, it's not me. Uh, okay, everyone. Welcome to Star Trek Trek Trek, our ongoing journey through the episodes of Star Trek as we watch. Them. And Dan has selected an episode for this week, as he rightfully <laughs> owned up to. I just need to turn the time code off. There we go. Uh, with TNG's uh, Season 1, Episode 18, Home Soil. This was written by <laughs> Carl Gers. This was the only episode he wrote. By Also by Ralph Sanchez. This is the only episode he wrote. And also by Robert Sabaroff, who also wrote The Immunity Syndrome and Conspiracy. Conspiracy. Was you know Carl. what? Three writers does explain the amount of exposition and dialogue that went on in here. This was directed by Corey Allen, very famous Corey Allen, who did Encounter at Farpoint. Final Mission, Journey's End, Paradise, and The Marquee Part 2. Um, but along with the other ones as well. Um, but not part this, one. So, yes. But not the first one, only the second one. Um, this was uh, the second draft. Would you like to know what the first one was called? The first one was called The Sandy Soils of Home. Uh, you can imagine oh why they changed Lord. it to Home I thought you were the Devil in the Dark. I, I was going to say this, this is actually the Devil in the Dirt, but there we are. <laughs> devil in the Dirt, there you go. Yep. And there you go. Final fun fact. Um, actually, no. There, I've got two final. I've got two fun facts on this episode. What the first one was. This is actually the final episode of the season, which Gene Roddenberry was the head writer. So the last head oh, episode by Gene Roddenberry can only get better from here. Uh, and also, you think that? Go on. Yeah. Uh, this was the second time on Star Trek for Caroline. Barry, 21 years earlier, she appeared as a Metron on Star Trek: The Original Series episode Arena. Under the name is Caroline Shell. I believe she was the engineering ensign um, who was there. Oh, the one who peaked, yeah. Oh, yes. Megan. Just say Megan. Megan. Yeah, okay. yes. <laughs> ensign Megan. Yeah. Ensign Megan. Home soil. Uh, guys, what do we think of this episode? I home soiled my pants. This is. <laughs> <laughs> nowhere near as exciting as I hoped it would be. So I apologize all, on behalf of all Trekkies everywhere. We're all kind of ragging this episode. I still kind of like it. Okay, it was very exposition heavy, but I, I kind of liked it still. I don't feel it was quite as boring as everyone was quite making out. But yeah, what, what did you guys think? It's exactly what I remember it being. <laughs> um, it's, yeah, it's just, it's ex death by a thousand expositions it's just <laughs> no i mean okay apart from uh you know the little laser fight that data gets into basically nothing happens it's all just static staring at lights and crystals and talking about uh the magic of the future of terraforming <laughs> and that's basically Welcome it. to the world of tomorrow <laughs> yeah so uh, yeah, yeah, it seems it seems like they really wanted to to push Star Trek as maybe some sort of educational. Like maybe I don't know. If, I think at the time there were weird things happening in the late '80s where you know if you were airing during certain windows and you had some amount of educational content, you'd get some grant money for whatever. I don't know yeah. if that applied. That was more for like uh, cartoons, I think, and Saturday morning programming. But but it does seem like they they were trying. And this happened again for for Doctor Who to bring it back to that. You know, in the early episodes, they had a a very mm -hmm. strong historical slide to the the very first season and even some of the second season episodes. Uh, all of those lost, of course. But um, but yeah, I mean, they they gave it a swing, and I think that I think that I'm I'm kind of proud of what they tried to do here, where they tried to show, hey, this yeah. is what people in the twenty the twenty third twenty fourth century. This is what people are doing. This is the jobs that they have. This is you know they may not always get along, but you know this is how they conduct themselves. And the Enterprise goes and sees what's up and checks up on them. And in the middle of this, they make first contact with this organism, and it's rare and beautiful and unique. And so I like I see everything that they had on the on pinned up in the little index cards on the board here and then when they just wrote the script it just they got so lost and it became such a maze of of just trying to figure out what was interesting and unique and, and star trekky about the episode and it, it just i think it got lost in the rewrite no you know yeah, what so it is it's like i think you're right and i think they forgot to put one index card up which said by the way punch up this dialogue because <laughs> like yeah. that entire bit with like Geordi and Date and Wolf set at the stations going over like the elements that were making up the, the, the microbrain as they called it that was all immediately elevated by the one joke of you know yeah. just like you know, your theory I wasn't asking you that immediately <laughs> made that the best scene of the episode because it had character it had humor and it had like personality to it if the rest of the episode had seen fit to put a few more jokes, a few more character moments in there. 
I think this would actually be a really good episode. <laughs> yeah, that's actually something that you did just hit on is that there were no character moments in this episode at all. You don't learn Unless anything. Unless your name is Troy. About... Well, all all you all you learn there is the fact that her powers could be interesting and useful if actually utilized by the writing mm. staff. But other than that, yeah, you don't learn a single thing about anyone in the entire episode except for the the entity, basically. Well, and that the uh, you do get a bit the, of pathos uh, from that lead. Uh, what was her name? Louisa. They get a little bit of pathos from her, and that she actually values the her terraforming project over the fact that one of her friends just died. Um, but you know, yeah. you do get a little yeah. bit of pathos from her. And about who, who nobody sheds any tears over, by the way. Yeah, they've been working with this guy as <laughs> one of eight people on a planet for three years. Oh yeah, he, he was a dick bag, anyways, right? So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. yeah I, I, I don't know. I, feel I think. Like... I, I felt like, you know, yeah, you're right. There is a lot of exposition. There's not many character moments, but there were, I don't know. I liked, I liked Mandel, the, the guy that, you know, he had enough character to kind of sell me as this, you know, arrogant, but slightly, you know, oh, I'm going to gonna wave my personality to their face and hopefully they won't notice I'm not actually saying anything meaningful. Um, and, you know, uh, <laughs> Troy, surprisingly, was competent. Like, this is, she, she betrays her own... Um, you know, uh, trope really of of being useless. She was actually useful here. He was hiding something and not showing it. Obviously, she had the point in it. Per so you know, shout out to Troy this episode of you know actually doing something good in her role. Yeah, she was yeah. a good left hand man to Picard in this episode. Mm -hmm. He needed some help, and this is this is what what is interesting that we can take away from the episode is that so Picard wound up being out of his element. He starts out being able to be the diplomat with with Doctor Mandel, and he was able to, uh, with a little bit of help from from Troy, figure out how to negotiate with him in a way to not only get them on the planet to intervene, but also to actually get enough access to be able to solve the murder mystery. Um, but then later on, he's completely unequipped to be able to negotiate with the the crystal an entity so you know that becomes like a, a little bit of a discomfort for him and, and i will call it that for the rest of the episode because this is not it's it's weird that we have we have two different episodes in the first season that focus on the crystal entity but <laughs> have we done data lore yet i don't know if we, we haven't there, no. but, yeah, have we done that uh, no, no wait, oh wait okay. is that still late in the season that is no uh we are we've skipped ahead in season one a bit at the moment so we'll oh, still, right, yeah, we, we, that will be earlier i think but yes sorry uh, but, also, like, but, also, but also later on so they completely take over Crusher's med bay and she's shrugging her shoulders. She's got her hands in her pockets for the entire episode, literally. <laughs> because she can't do her damn job. And so it's just like, all right, well, let's get Jordy the geologist on it and he can, you know, <laughs> figure out what's going on with the cadmium can, levels in here. He can rock so, it. So so it was interesting seeing the crew have to use leverage each other and use their talents in different ways because things weren't as clean cut in this episode so I appreciated that but it really was just those tiny little bits that we got most of the episode was just yeah like you said just standing around talking I, yeah I feel like there were definitely avenues that they could have used to like spice this up and make it a little bit more interesting like for one thing like we could, I, I brought up the Genesis project and how that's portrayed and it's like the, um, there's a really important bit in Ralph Khan where like you get to see what it's like living on regular, uh, well, in the, the regular space station, um, and like they make references to playing you know, bridge after dinner, like you know, like they they talk about like you know, having been here for ages and like, oh data banks and stuff. That you get a feeling that these people have actually lived and worked together for a while. They have a rapport going, and it makes that scene when you find um, the scientists that are dead and strung up later on. To have a bit of impact, not because you you know they're, they're not exactly named characters, not important, but it's like they are more than just bodies, and that's yeah. all that Mallinson was in this is that he there was no personality, he didn't feel anything when he died, um, and I feel like that would have done a lot to like elevate this episode, just like a little bit more character. Um, I also feel like they completely did themselves out of a completely different plot, and they don't lean into the murder mystery angle at all, like. Yeah that occupies mm. maybe a minute and a half of dialogue and you're like "Ooh, is this going to be a locked room mystery type thing where it's like who could have had and then it's just like no it was the Quick, someone get Jonathan they, Creek. they don't <laughs> they, they don't get the tension out of it at all there's no dramatic tension yeah. there's no digging into these people's personal lives see if there's any enmity because these characters don't exist beyond their expository roles they yeah. exist purely as certain stereotype versus certain stereotype versus other stereotype oh, and man. dialogue troll and it's like you know what stars it, ear 
You're right, because the moment that Will walked in on whatever her name was, poorly dubbed Louisa, yeah. poor, Louisa. And he figures out that the reason that she's crying is not for her teammate, but for her work. Mm -hmm. He should have immediately been suspicious of her as the killer. Yeah. It could have gone a, a totally different way and been way more interesting. But it's he's like, oh, yeah. oh, you're beautiful. Okay, fine. Well, let's take on a date <laughs> to, see the, to see the rock candy later. So, all right. <laughs> yeah, that's <just> <laughs> Yeah, and it's like, I'm not saying that, you know, because guess what, like, you can take the same kind of concept to move elsewhere, like, that's how you get Ariel, which, you know, we'll get to eventually. Um, but it's like, there, there's stuff here, there are elements that, like, even though they talk and talk and talk and talk, it's such like, there are so many elements that just aren't pulled on a pull, and they're just, like, happy to just leave as the most basic versions of themselves, it's kind of a shame. So it's like, that, that minute and a half could have been used in some other way to make the story richer it's like why even tease that if you're not going to mm. do anything with it yeah it just make it yeah, go, yeah. Sorry, go. go ahead idol uh, this would have been the perfect moment to bring in someone like space columbo or like you know the samuel <laughs> t cogley of this episode have another mm. character okay a case of another character but have someone come in that is specifically an investigator or I'll give give yaron wharf that role or data even and have that more in their yeah. kind of wheel you know he's a sherlock holmes fan that was established this season and you know how well, come it, into it, it you know it seems pretty obvious that the writers wanted you to feel some mm. aspect of sympathy for the terraforming forming team it's like they keep making reference to you know the year of work and all of this research and time that has been lost but it's like they don't do any of the legwork necessary to give that any weight so yeah, there you yeah, don't they're... feel anything they actively sabotage that because they're so misanthropic that you can't really empathize yeah. with them. Um, yeah. So that, that's the other thing is that, so yeah, it, the episode did kind of do a bait and switch, right? You know, so like it, it changes partway through it. It's just too many characters is the other problem too. You, you see, you mentioned bringing in a Columbo. Okay, another character, but so it's a first season. So they're still trying to establish. They had the, the scene where everybody's glad handing each other when they first beam down and they take the time. They take 30 seconds to introduce every single member of the entire cast who all beam down together to go to see the planet, everybody except the cards down there. Uh, and then they introduce the entire team and we go through it all over again with more handshaking. And it's just like, okay, great. So how many characters? We have like, I think 11 characters in the room by the end of the, and we know all of their names. And so now we've got to suffer through this. And this is why there's too much, there's too much exposition because everybody had to get a line here. And then I guess maybe, you know, if this was Clue and so, you know, we had to figure things out and it was all everybody trapped in a room and we got to figure this out, that would have been a, a completely different story, but they mm -hmm. had to bring it back to the Enterprise and do cool things with Crusher, so... <laughs> Such cool things, yeah. yeah it, it, I, I feel like there was just like a, like a lack of focus going on, which is like weird when you get into the actual meat and potatoes of the episode, which is talking about inorganic life for about half an hour and making it sound like the dullest thing ever when it should be the coolest thing ever. See, like the, the first think... time the Starfleet has ever encountered it, too. Which is yeah, totally. totally. This, yeah, this totally. is this yeah. is an episode that, that I remember from you know when I watched it for the first run when I was very young, and I remember sticking in my head because of that very concept of. You know, and I think, oh, what was this, 89? I think I must not probably have watched it to yeah. 88, so I wouldn't have watched it to about 91, 92. So, you know, going through school and you're learning and like life and things like that. And then the idea, and I bear in mind I hadn't watched TOS at this point, so I had no idea of, you know, no kill eye, the horter. Um, you know, the idea that life could evolve outside of your concept was a little bit mind blowing. You know, it could be things that you don't understand or it breaks that wall of, you know, understanding between, you know, what can be. Def, you know, definitions of certain things and that was kind of a, a, a moment for myself but you're right it, it wasn't quite the holy like oh my gosh this is incredible and they do this again like they do this concept so many times like you get to the end of season seven and they have the computer that comes alive and it's exactly the same plot it's a very tropey star trek thing to do to have oh but it's in the universe in, in the little mini universe in ds9 pup um, you know, it, it yeah. happens so many times. Mor Moriarty, you can say like right. Moriarty, yeah, exactly, yep. exactly. So it's it's yeah, you're right. This is probably the the, the least least. Sorry, my talking fast. Made the least best version of this. <laughs> yeah, I, I think they just got the priorities in, in the exact wrong order. Like they spent so much time up front talking about terraforming and how interesting that is, and then it's like a minute and a half of murder mystery bait and switch. And then, oh, by the way, you're meeting a brand new species for the first time that expands your concept of what life can be. And then it's over. 
What was the what was the that. Voyager episode we watched? Was it ex post facto where they had the 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 noir murder mystery oh, where they yeah. really just leaned into it for the whole episode? Yeah. And I, I was big. I was up on that episode. I, I thought it was great because they actually picked a direction. They went for it. They swung for the fences, and for better or for worse, they delivered a product that was interesting to watch. And and so this just seems like a you know an episode written by committee where just everybody yeah. had to get everything well, in yeah. and. There's no room for art. I was going to say, like, this definitely is of the era era when they had the show Bible, some books that were written before the series from the show Bible, and Gene Rodney's, yeah. like, handwritten notes on a napkin he met down the pub that or the bar that night. And, you know, it, it, it was written for the Bible and not so much as a case of, like, yeah, let's make this cohesive, because the characters aren't defined at all until really season two. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's, it's also a case that they don't even bother putting in any, like... There's no stake here because it's like we're going to exposit at you for like at least like 20 30 minutes on like terraforming and what it is and how it works we're not going to bother to show you why this is important we're not going to show you a picture of what we think this planet is projected to look like in well, a few decades did. they kind of did no they had don't the, do the enough they the show planet. you like look it's slightly greener it's like no show me a <laughs> yeah. verdant yeah they show you phase land. one and phase two of the subdivision and they're not going to yeah. show you what the rest of the city looks like yeah, they would have really broken the budget to have like phil down in the art department paint up a matte painting that would have looked really pretty you know this like, is sure, earth, there's one already this is earth the with pretty. sugar frosting on it yes right. <laughs> yeah, exactly like <laughs> And it's like there's no there's no stake where like they would go oh well you know there's a, a shortage e even in Wrath of Khan because I keep on going back to it like Carol Marcus mentions problems of your know, galactic population and food supply and like there's a reason why we bother to terraform planets you know, or like people why, why people write reasons why people become colonists in a, a era in which you can just live on Earth and you can just fucking rise Atlantis from the oceans if you want to. That's just a thing you can do to fuck around with. So there has to be a compelling reason why you leave. And it's because yeah. you like the, 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 the adventure, you like the, the thrill of it, and it's like, you couldn't make this look like a more boring prospect. Terraforming is really interesting, actually, but you don't put in any work into it. And the oh, one character wow. who's meant to epitomize the romance of it, who literally is pointed out in dialogue as possessing, you know, highly abstracted ideas, little data, but big dreams. It's like the most underwritten wayfish nothing character possible, where it's like, you don't get to hear what her dreams of what Valara 3 might become in the future. She doesn't say, oh, I hope it will become a cultural center. I hope that, you know, my family didn't have any throwing growing up. You know, like, you know, it's like a big food choice. Like, there's a million and one things you could do with the script. How about, you were talking about the show Bible, right? Does anyone else remember in the show Bible that fucking Tasha Yar comes from a failed Federation colony and might have some thoughts about, like, the creation of an idyllic dream planet from base zero and about how that could go wrong? Or how about that? That could be a really wonderful thing and maybe she has some kind of investment on it. No! Just the absolute refusal to have any of these characters engage on an emotive level until it becomes about a, lo a load of light-emitting diodes I on a table. But don't you remember that she's really sad? <laughs> because I know that's... I couldn't tell that through all the ADR dialogue. <laughs> yeah, it's just. But uh, it was she's... a character very brief. It was just very sad. Yeah, no, like I... every sing every scene that she's in from after the first scene, she has tears in her eyes. Yeah. Like that's her defining character trait. She's yeah. sad, and I yeah. think that comes yeah. down. And it's, it's too many characters there's too much to do yeah, here they should have yeah. like focused on like you know either just the head honcho or just, just she should have been the head of the project yeah. and maybe been obstructive yeah. i herself. wonder so stars i really like your point i want to i want to because when you have warp speed you can go anywhere you can colonize anywhere so why bother terraforming i wonder if they're all disgruntled and pissed off because they realized halfway through the project they're just creating like the star the starfleet projects like the equivalent of the affordable housing for... <laughs> it's like oh shit guys wait a minute we're not gardeners of edens here are we <laughs> we're, we're just like we're just like drywallers of Edens. So uh, we yeah, we just make, got the we're making space Cleveland. Yes. It's like, uh, so we just got the requisition here for the planet order. Once it's completed, what's it going to be? Oh, we're going to look grow a load of drugs. Oh, cool. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. But yeah, it's like there's no even mention of like artistry of like. That's right. Of, I think it's in, in Mass Effect. I think there's a reference of like someone terraforming a planet and putting like a a, a signature or 
creating their own bespoke mountain range. Oh, that's, like, yeah, like, that's, that's hitchhikers. That is that's uh, that's that was, yeah, 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 that's really, uh, creating the wonderful Slowly fjords. First, yes. Yeah. <laughs> a touch of whimsy. A touch of whimsy. A, a, a tiny little bit of the milk of the human soul would have elevated this from beyond drudgery. Something yeah. really quite emotive, really. Actually, the the elements are here, but yeah. they're just like nah. Yeah. Nah. They, g- yeah. they gave you it want, no you wanted reason Douglas to Adams, be. Y- yeah. Yeah. You wanted Douglas Adams, you got Robert Sabaroff. Congratulations. So. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> Brutal. <laughs> All right. Let's go on to our best and worst moments. The best advice I can give you is to just be yourself. You're the worst thing that ever happened to Zach. You're the worst thing that ever happened to me. Actually, that's the second best piece of advice. In fact, you're the worst thing that ever happened to the entire Ferengi Alliance. No. 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 Just stop saying that. I love how that starts off like with the. I love how that starts like the intro to Sprack that Zarathustra. No, 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 no. Well, yeah, it really does feel like it should go. No, 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 no. Yeah. Dun, 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 dun. Okay, let's go with our best and worst moments. Stars, you shall start us off this week. Oh. Oh boy. Okay, so you know what? I'm going to get ahead of the pack because there's slim pickings this week. Um, the best is Troy. I, I'm sorry, mm-hmm. I am a sucker for competent Troy. She does really well here. <laughs> she is so confident. She, it's nice to see. It does, honestly, happen so infrequently. She is competent. She is direct. She does not hesitate to tell Picard that he's moving in the wrong direction. Um... Yeah. She's empathetic in the right places. She's like actively engaged in discussions. If this was the Troy we got the entire TMTNG, I feel like a lot of people, a lot of people would love her a lot more because she's just so incredibly, like not even quietly competent, but just like she's incredibly professional. She, this is exactly yeah. who I want on the bridge. Like all of that stuff at the very beginning of the episode, that's worth the price of admission. That is why she's on the bridge. Like that's perfect. And it's like, it also kind of makes it a bit more of a sticky wicket when uh, you know Picard goes, "Oh, you're basing all these uh, suppositions of yours on the feelings of your pet Betazoid in uh, the drumhead," and he's like, "Oh, maybe I should reconsider all that," but you know he doesn't because it's too fucking useful. But yeah, a competent Troy is my best. Worst, um, I feel like I've just, I've been banging this drum, but it's like the sheer lack of like of heart. There's like a few bits and pieces here where something shines through, where someone bothered to punch up the dialogue. Mm. There's a few bits and pieces here where someone remembered that these characters have character and backgrounds and thoughts on things that are influenced by where they came from and where they want to go. Um, but for the most part, it's just like, this is scientist stereotype number one. This is scientist stereotype number two. This is scientist stereotype number three, who is not really even a stereotype. He has so little character. He just exists to provide more dialogue. And it's like, you could have condensed this down into into like maybe one character if you were really feeling fresh, but they weren't. Um, <laughs> it's just it's just a bit of a drudge, honestly. It's like, the, the, but between the director and the writer, they really should have just sat down and had a conversation about, this is boring. How do we streamline this and make it more fun? And they just didn't have that conversation. Okay. Damn. So I'll start with my best moment. And this was a really, really tiny little thing in the episode, but it's something that stuck with me is the image of Jordy looking down this, this drill hole with data just behind him over his shoulder. And it's one of the few buddy moments we get with them early on. Later on, they mm. develop their friendship. But this is this is the two of them just kind of existing with each other, doing their jobs well. And Jordy is just, and this is a credit to LeVar Burton, with him being able to act with the stupid girl's barrette over his face. And you really <laughs> you really do believe, with, with all the awful acting in this episode, and there are some real stinkers, looking at you, Richard Dean Anderson wannabe. And... Um, <clears throat> <laughs> um, with, with, so with all the garbage, just him seeing the simple beauty of what's at the end of that mine shaft and that being our first glimpse as the audience into into the direction that the episode will be going and having data there to just appreciate that with them was just really lovely and the, the lighting on their faces you could see as the, the the crystal at the bottom of the drill hole is kind of just faintly illuminating them just really done well the tight shot with the two of them um you know uh, the the worst moment uh, 
I think it's the, it's the the first time that that uh, Doctor Poopy Fans Poopy Fans was his name Doctor Mandel like he yeah. gets he gets so pissed Mandel off that Picard yeah B- 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 Picard taking the piss out of him that he just puts his hands in his pockets and he storms out of the <laughs> the ready room like a toddler because I'm not gonna have to listen to you I'm the boss and you can- oh my God <laughs> I don't go, I don't take life I create it. Like, dude, I know you're a good actor. Why you like this? <laughs> but there's there's one tiny moment though where he actually has his hands in his pockets and he doesn't know what to do with them. So he actually pushes his fingers up through his pants pockets like <laughs> on his way out the door. Go back and watch it if you missed it. It's hilarious. <laughs> Anyways, okay, that's it. Big. Okay, so I I think the best moment is. I mean, it's low hanging fruit, but it's the just the the snappy comeback to the computer from Worf. That's the, I wasn't asking you, because <laughs> yeah. that was just the the only moment of lightness and levity in the entire episode, basically. Because everyone else is just deathly serious, basically from start to finish. Um, and but honorable mention just to the the concept, the high concept of uh, life as we don't know it or like life uh, beyond our uh, current understanding. That's like, that's a great idea to start an, an episode with. It just was not executed at all. So the worst, the worst is just a collective fail from the art and set design department <laughs> of this episode, <laughs> because it's like you were talking about, um, you know, that moment with Jordy, and seeing the entity for the first time, what that ends up being is like a little light bulb at the bottom of a shaft. Yeah. <laughs> and then you bring it into sick bay and it's a light bulb under a bell jar in sick bay. And then that turns into, you know, a sugar crystal in sick bay. And the the terraforming bay, the wonder of the future is like a hotel yeah. conference room with like oak doors. And it's just like everything is just dour and dull and just no oh, the no part of it with D. <laughs> yeah well it's just no part of it has any visual interest mm. it looks cheap it is cheap mm. and it cheapens the story so yeah just the design of this entire episode this was is, wrong this is, from the word I, I think go. this is a, a case for why you know we don't have 26 episode seasons is because you do get set design like this which can be endearing in a certain way and you go like oh you can see the corners they cut to give us more episodes but at the same time you're like I see at least three or four different uh, set or pieces from different sets being yeah. used right here because I've watched enough Star Trek well not just yeah, well, that and that's but- like IMDb says that uh, uh, in, on the terraforming planet, most of the uh, most of the devices we saw there were borrowed from Knight Rider. So if that explains no. anything, <laughs> yep. <laughs> oh, so, yeah, okay. Awful. Incredible. All right. C- case in point. So you have finally gotten to the part of the story where you're talking about silicon-based life that life and you have accepted that it is life now. It's like, oh wow, you're watching it give birth. It's a light in a bell jar. What? Miracle of birth. Now it's two light bulbs in a bell jar. There are two lights. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no visual sells itself at all. Yeah. I think it's just a case of the budget, really, because this is a lot of. Yeah, it is. This, yeah. Of course it is. But if you can't do that, then don't do it. Well, yeah, that's true. That is true. You can't I think do I'm... that. Then just the whole episode with talking. I mean, which Wait, can be that. good. We've had yeah. dialogue-heavy episodes, but the the key there is to make the dialogue engaging. Like, you know, I've yeah. said before, I'm very sorry, we're watching the Twilight Zone episode, and I was just like, some of my favorite episodes, just two people in a room talking, and you are glued to it. Anyone with mm. Bridges Meredith is there, and you're just like, yeah, I'm there. <laughs> the bird. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go with my best one. I really like Director Mandel. I thought he was cool. I thought he was affluent and... and um, dramatic enough a little bit hammy on the edges to be to be entertaining to watch i wish the kind of the whole episode was more about him or he was more focused in the terraforming project than rather than creating more characters but i really liked him my my worst one is the life form itself as i said before i love the concept of you know life but not as we know it um that's great that's a core tenant of star trek and they do do it quite a lot um, I like the idea that they, you know, they stumble on it because it's a, it's kind it's kind of like ribbing off Wrath of Khan a little bit there. It's like, oh, we found a life form there all along. That turned out to be Khan. This turned out to be Khan. 
Um, because these, because um, <laughs> 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 oh, um, at the end, you know, they 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 spend some time. They reproduce. You see all this. You know, it's very much classic. You know, you know, they didn't have the budget, so they had to tell and not show so much. This is definitely telling and not showing, which is the wrong way around. Yeah. Um, but. Uh, you know, you get these cre- you know these creatures. They they reproduce. They take control of the ship. They start influencing things around them. You get to the point where Picard's about to go like initiate self destruct Alpha three one four eight seven two, but it turns out that if you just turn the lights down, they go no no we surrender we surrender we don't have control the of the lights. The entire civilization could be knocked out with the clapper. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, so yeah you just turn the lights down they're just like ah I have the upper hand of the negotiation because again that's another plot point it's another Picard negotiating with you using his amazing skills as like an ace negotiator to, 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 to you know convince people to you know a, a race of species to do what they want but um no, that lasts about five seconds. They're like, ah, oh, turn the lights down. We surrender. Take us back, but don't come back for three hundred <laughs> years. Otherwise, we'll ah, well, you know. Well, and then <laughs> well, also, yeah, it's, yeah. It, they make a point to talk about how the thing has reprogrammed the computer. It's interfacing with the computer and won't let it beam itself out or anything. But it didn't think to control the light source that yeah. is its that is entire yeah. limit. Yeah. It depends yeah. on. Like, it'd be one thing if Riker had to, like, b- they duck his head in and fire a phaser at the lights or whatever, but, like, I guess yeah. we didn't have the BFX oh. budget for that. That's yeah. a much better last five minutes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He'll have to bring that in. Um, but no, I, and I found them sort of very, it was all of a sudden, it was just like, we don't know if this is life, and then they're talking. And they're just straight up just talking. Where from, we don't know. We just have to assume they gain control of the, the communication systems. But it's just like, we are talking. We would like to talk to you about our extended warranty and all this. And um, it was it, it was all just a bit like that. Like like I said, like I like the... Con- well, we'll come on to that in a moment. Let's go on to our ratings. I can show you my rating code. Schiller rating 3-5. Associational rating norm minus 3. That's much too low a rating. I'm just not accustomed to seeing an unsatisfactory rating on a member of my crew. Mm, so unsatisfactory. <laughs> He's with us right now. Uh, stars, what is our rating criteria for this week? So I was originally going to go with how many inorganic light emitting diodes out of 10, which I was pretty happy with. So I thought that was just that's decent. But it got blown out of the water because, gentlemen, how many dick bags of mostly water out of 10 would you like <laughs> yes! to give this episode? Oh, I'm so glad. Yes. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> this is why I love getting to do the race, because the amount of joy I can oh, bring people is so good. Yeah, that's so oh, that's good. Since... The best rating ever. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the going up there with the uh, horse's name Tango, I think. Um, stars, <laughs> start us off. What, what are you going for? Like, I, I know I just spent, like, like half an hour just like, dunking on this episode, and I feel like it does deserve it, because, like, I'm writing a better version of this in my head, like, already. Just taking the bare bones, mm. and this is bare bones, and, like, constructing a better story around it. Um, mm. Bones. But the thing is, is, like, as a kid watching this TNG season one, I've, I've related the story as many times. I was like, yeah, all I had was first contact, Ralph Kant, and TNG season one. So guess what? There were some <laughs> real plateaus of quality. There were some real down lows. Mm. Um, but I remember finding this episode interesting because it was my first introduction to the idea of inorganic life, the idea of terraforming. Like, if you've never watched science fiction before and you want to just get, like, maybe the most boring but maybe the most direct version of it this is kind of that it's like what's a science fiction episode well it's you know like a you you think it's one thing but it's actually another and you have to expand your perspective and question your assumptions like that's the the basic tenet of science fiction right and this is the most archetypal you know question your assumptions or they'll challenge your assumptions or they'll challenge you type thing um it's just done in such a very dull way and I, I keep mm. it's so very middle of the road I feel like I'm going to have to downgrade from a 6 to a 5.5 because I feel like on the whole I don't hate this episode but I do massively mourn um, what this could have been and I, I'm already feeling like I should write like a tabletop adventure that <laughs> fixes this episode and like make it more interesting so oh. yeah for it's me it's 5... show wrote itself 
<laughs> home soil too and I can boogaloo um, yeah. so yeah this is 5.5 dick bags of mostly water uh, fantastic <laughs> Dan alright I started at 4 I had some heavy nostalgia for this episode yeah it was it was pretty boring but I feel like there were there were like 3 or 4 different reasonable episodes fighting to get light here and and, uh, mm-hmm. and Riker just kept turning down the lights on them all so <laughs> the <laughs> um, I Man, I want to rate this higher. I really do, because out of out of in, so this is me being a season one apologist here, right? Because I mean, there is some good Star Trek here in season one, and uh, I won't say there is some good performance in this episode, performances in this episode, but we did get some good, um, some good insight into how the crew can help each other be better. Um, so you know, the the crew actually overcomes. I feel like there real really was some drama here, and even though it's trite, they're taking over the Enterprise again. This has happened three times already this season. Uh, you know, <laughs> you know, it's something they do well. They've got you know, they've got. Um, I just I'm out of I don't know I'm out of good things to say here, so I guess I gotta leave it. <laughs> I had so much steam, and then it just disappeared. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I I think I got it right. I have to stamp pat on a four here. It's just it's just not. It's just not what it could be, and I'm not going to judge it based on what it could be. It's what we just saw, and that you know, it's it's just just low low end down at the yeah. bottom of the drill hole. <laughs> nice. Sorry, full. What was that? For dick bags of mostly water, Thank we you. only speak in one syllables. <laughs> in one unbroken sentence. Okay, uh, big. <laughs> go for go for it. So I I pre-rated this a two. I remembered it being real bad, real boring. Guess what? Real bad, real boring. <laughs> um, but it's like like you said. I mean, there there are redeeming qualities to the ideas of the episode. It's just executed like paint by numbers style, to where it just explains the things that are happening and end. It doesn't do anything with it, and I just I feel like I can't give it any credit for taking a big swing because it just Mm. like grounded it into the dirt right in front of itself (laughs) uh so I'm I'm sticking with the two it's just it's it's good ideas awfully executed and it's the execution that matters so two. it's like they they needed an idea from an episode so they're like all right let's what's in the theme song new life and new civilization so okay let's just figure out something and we'll make a new civilization and then yeah, here's our episode okay good just cut print all right yeah nothing there <laughs> yeah. man someone yeah. big fancy guy was like i want to print it by morning <laughs> get it on the papers get it on the <laughs> <laughs> yeah spitting newspapers everywhere um i i'm a little bit of an apologist for this episode i i liked it i i you know, okay, I see all the flaws. The dialogue is mostly exposition, exposition. I like the concept behind it. Like you say, stars, there are kernels of a better episode that are wasted on this on these forty five to fifty minutes. Um you know, the data bit's kinda of funny when you're dodging around, you get nice moments from Geordie, you get Riker being a sleaze ball, um, as usual, you get uh, you know, yeah. Uh, you get Picard being a little bit of the, you know the diplomatic side, and, but with a little bit of a sympathetic air. He recognizes life. He recognizes it's not the the miner's fault by the end, except when it is, and it turns out that he uses Troy responsibility. You know, there there are bits in here. That it is very exposition heavy, but you know I, I always use like five as my rating as just like this was an episode of Star Trek. It doesn't do anything good. Doesn't do anything bad. This airs slightly lower than that for me, so I'm going to go with a four point five. Mo- uh, dick bags of mostly water because this sort of just sits just under it's just slightly underperforms what uh, what it should have done um, and with that that brings this episode to an average of four four point oh straight on the dot about right in the van. I, I think and four lights four yeah. there are definitely four <laughs> there are well you've got to be careful those four lights because if you give if you acknowledge them as life they'll keep reproducing so let's just stick a box over the whole thing and walk away <laughs> put a box on it <laughs> yeah, you know what if we're doing uh, if we're doing that like that, adding that to the format I, guess I think... what this entire episode could have been solved with a box yeah solve the box solved. i'm definitely like putting it. that on the notes we are going to be having in future episodes <laughs> could you fix this episode with a box i can't wait to be uh, 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 gold cut destroy right here in home soil <laughs> yeah uh. okay <laughs> stars dan big 
thank you for joining us uh, for this amazing <laughs> watch Thanks, through. Because sometimes even even the, the average episodes can make us all laugh. For everyone else, join us back again if you're watching live. We'll be back on Wednesday with a bit of Star Trek Smackdown. Yeah, come get Ooh, some. Be fun. And uh, we'll be back on Super. And in yeah, and in two weeks will be our next Trek Trek episode. I believe we will be having one with Abby Sommer from the First Flight Podcast. Ooh. She'll be joining us in a couple of awesome. weeks to talk about an Enterprise episode, which is going to be a lot of fun. Nice. Until then, we will see you next time. And ta-ra!